guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the most interesting folks to talk about the big picture future. Today, we've got somebody who's done that in a couple of different ways, Sean Gurley on the program. Sean, thanks for coming. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Sean, you pretty much told me you wanted to talk about Wieners and Wieners Law before the podcast. So let's jump right into AI, Adverse Neural Networks. What are you working on today? Um, I mean, from my side, we're spending a lot of time um, taking... Uh, I guess, taking the best kind of uh, neural network topologies and applying them to um, both understanding language and also generating language. So the uh, the two sides of reading and uh, and writing. So this is this has been a, an area of, of kind of huge um, scientific gains in the past uh, six or 12 months. And um, it's it's been a fun time to be part of that. Creative AI, where are we headed? Well, so it's interesting, right? I, I think when we look at creative like machines, right, it's always been the sense that you know, between us as humans and machines, the thing that differentiated us was was our creativity, right? And it's always fascinating. We look at this um, look at the space of of like what defines human intelligence, and it's always sort of like a goalpost that keeps moving. But at the moment, it's kind of creativity, right? Creativity is where a lot of people will say that's the difference between um, humans and machines. Um, I think what's interesting now is we're starting to see machines become creative, right? And these are in the sort of the neural networks being applied to generate information, right? whether it's, you know, um, generative adversarial networks for um, images or it's large transformer models for text um, or it's, um, you know, the generation of new strategies inside of reinforcement learning in games like Go or, or things like, um, you know, StarCraft. So as you're moving through these spaces, machines are starting to create things. And um, I think the jury is out as to whether they're better than humans or not. Um, it's an interesting question, right? Um, you know, how do you start to evaluate their results? And should you evaluate them according to the same parameters that, that we humans um, judge? Or is it that as soon as a machine can create it, it's no longer creative anymore? So some really fascinating things. But I think the most exciting thing for me is that we're starting to look at these things that machines create and going, huh, it's not bad. It's interesting. It's, it's, but we're almost evaluating it as if it was a human peer. And that's just not something that we were doing like even like, you know, 24 months ago. And to be fair, we don't really understand how creativity works with humans. I, I think that's right. I think one of the things that's kind of coming out of this, um, you know, is it does force a bit of introspection into kind of what it means to be human and what it means to uh, to kind of actually do the things that make us human. Yeah, creativity. I mean, if you can combine a banana and an apple, get a little flavor of both, that's creative. And yet you're just taking two things that already exist. Is that what, how would you define creativity if you had to define it? One of my favorite, it's still one of my favorite scientific papers was a paper came out of Harvard. Um, I guess it's about five years old now, but it was a flavor network paper. So it was using network topology and mapping to kind of understand the interaction of the different compounds inside of food flavors. So to kind of take your point, banana plus apple, you know, that would be a connectivity within that kind of flavor graph. And one of the things that the, uh, the researchers did is they mapped all this out and then they mapped kind of um, all the different um types of uh, food cuisines around the world and found different kind of areas where different, um, you know, regional cuisines focused. Um, but more to the point was they found this idea of making connections on that graph that had never existed before, right? Connecting two foods uh, or two flavor profiles that had never been connected. Now, the interesting thing about that is you're into kind of permutations, right? And it, it, the, the number of combinations of all the different things is massive. And the number of recipes that we've ever created is just a tiny fraction of the possible recipe space, right? And so creativity is kind of, I think, it's the connection of, it's the connection of objects together to create something that works um, whilst navigating an incredibly large um, you know, uh, combinatorial space. So I think creativity exists within the combinatorial space where most um, connections are bad and some are brilliant. And I don't know, maybe that's just a mathematician's kind of way of looking at this. But I, I've always found that creativity comes from connecting things that most people don't think should be connected. And not necessarily getting it right, but being willing to go out there on a limb and try it anyways. Well, well, that, that's the thing, right? Like um, one of the things they found inside of this was that, you know, um, you know, the distance of the connection is actually something that, that kind of makes it more risky. It's less probable, right, that the kind of the further the distance the connection you make and, you know, I think that's kind of where the genius things happen, right? It's, it's where it's when you connect two things that are so disparate and so disconnected that no one ever thought they should ever belong together, but somehow it works. And I think the reality is when you're doing that, most of it doesn't work, right? And, and the hard thing about kind of anything with creativity is, 
you, you can pick almost any piece um, of that puzzle and it's not going to, it's not going to be good. Right. But one, one out of a hundred, one out of a thousand, one out of a million, you know, depending where you're playing is, is going to be genius. Right. And, I, and yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, I'd argue the farther away, they farther apart they are, the more likely you are to get a stepwise function increase versus getting a, a five or 10% improvement. Yeah, what was interesting, a friend of mine um, did the study in terms of uh, papers that won, you know, scientific papers that won prestigious prizes. So you can kind of map out the connections of all the different papers. And then the question was, you know, when a new paper comes in to that kind of like landscape, right, a scientific paper, um, does it connect um, locally or does it connect across these large distances? And what they actually found was that most um, papers that won awards um, were actually connected a medium amount of, of distance, right? It wasn't short, it wasn't long, it was a medium amount. Um, and so it was interesting, and that, that may reflect more of how we evaluate, right? We'll, we'll give the, the major awards, the Nobel Prizes, to things that are, um, you know, not so risky uh, as to be, um, you know, these huge kind of connections, or these huge steps, but they're, they're kind of like, they're somewhat risky, uh, but still acceptable. So I, I think I think there's an interesting thing of how do we evaluate um, what what success looks like inside of this? What's our utility function? Um, and uh, you know that 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 I think once you start um, mapping out these connections, um, you can start to try and quantify these things. And there are scientists kind of doing this at the moment, and some really really fascinating research going into it. Speaking of utility functions, how do we design them into AI so as not to cause problems? We'll say. Well. You know, this is, goes back to Wiener's law, which we started with. Um, you know, uh, re, you know, automation will routinely, uh, you know, tidy up, um, you know, and create efficiencies, and occasionally kind of create extraordinary messes. And I think, I think when we think about failure modes for um, AI systems, they're going to have different kinds of failure modes to, to what we humans have, um, and that's going to be an interesting thing for us. Sometimes I think the other part of this is you kind of create this automation, is that you. Um, you actually end up creating these these kinds of like large scale crashes that never would have existed in a human system. So one of the things as you go through this, um, utility functions matter, um, but you can create simulations to start to kind of play with these um, parameters and start to kind of see how they behave under different stressed environments. Um, that's if you can create a utility function, right? And a lot of things, particularly in the commercial and the business world, it doesn't lend itself uh, to a utility function and you know, it's kind of like, you know, is it a good thing um, to kind of like put, um, put uh, you know, uh, increased trade sanctions um, in response to, to China's, um, you know, China's pressure on Hong Kong and yeah. democracy, right? I mean, what's the utility function on that? And so it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to think about how you even kind of create that in a simulation, you know, versus kind of like I can certainly create a utility function inside a game of StarCraft. Yeah, the more you simplify it, the easier it is to do. That's, yeah, that, it, yeah. That's kind of yeah. your job, isn't it? Looking at the the big picture dynamics around how things play out. Yeah, a lot of our customers are playing in that space where you have got a lot of complexity in what they're operating in, whether it's um, financial bets, whether it's um, commercial um, strategic bets, or it's big geopolitical bets. And um, the hard thing on this is, um, you know, the complexity of interactions that are unfolding inside of that. But I think the other, you know, the other side of this is that, you know, there is information out there that is undoubtedly valuable um, for those decision makers. And the question is, how do you get that in front of them? Uh, particularly, how do you get that information in front of the decision makers in a world where there's just huge volumes um, of data that you have to um, navigate and, um, and and filter and sort? Um, and so. I think one of the things that's been fascinating as we've seen with, our, with our, the world that we're in is that um, we've collectively done a wonderful job of collecting um, and, and amassing huge amounts of data. Um, now that the, the job is to kind of figure out what it all means. And how do we do that? Do we need to be able to model all this data with quantum computers where we can run through every simulation? Or are there simplifications that we can use? Um, you know, I don't think we need quantum um, to do this stuff just yet. I think there's there's still a lot of uh, legs left in the, in the in the classical compute uh, paradigm. Um, so I think part of the part of the game here is actually, you know, as as we see it, is is actually building up um, enough training data um, so the machines can get into a supervised um, uh, framework and start to uh, start to be able to kind of um, automate the processing of that information and, and the big big um, thing is not compute it's not the algorithms it's it's fundamentally it's training data and you know what does that mean concretely 
Um, it means, you know, you know, you've got to take all the work that analysts are doing, classifying information and start to turn that into things that um, the machines can, can learn from so they can start to replicate these tasks um, and do them at a scale that humans can't and then ultimately see patterns and structures that perhaps humans are missing um, just because of the limited cognitive, um, you know, bandwidth that we have. Who is that process net positive or net negative on jobs when it comes to automation? I think one of the things we're seeing is it's, it's rare that an entire job um, gets automated away. And, and that may be part of the early um, things that we're seeing. You know, this may just be a, a symptom of, you know, it, it's early into the space. Um, but we are seeing certainly tasks being automated, right? And these could be one, two, three hour tasks a day um, that are definitely ripe for automation. And, you know, I think what we're seeing at least, and we'll probably see for the next few years, is, is a rebalancing of tasks um, between things that were exclusively human to things that are now exclusively machines. Um, but it's, at least in the white collar world, it doesn't seem to be entire jobs um, yet. So um, I've no doubt that as machines kind of like work their way up the cognitive ladder, um, entire jobs will go. But I think the reality is it's more, it's more orientated around specific tasks at the moment. Um, obviously, that's, that's going to have an impact uh, um, uh, on jobs, but um, I don't see it just yet. I mean, even in that regard, if you are talking about just tasks, if you're automating 50% of a person's time, you just need half as many people. Well, yeah, so I think that's part of it, but but it's interesting, you know, as you as you go through that, um, you can certainly do the same task with half the number of people, um, and so you know the question is: is there other tasks that the person should be doing that they're not? And I think most people inside of the organisations that we're seeing is, you know, the tasks that we would be automating um, and that we are automating. Um, most of the time, that's not the highest value task that the organization wants the person doing, right? So I think they would view it much more as kind of like, you know, we're automating part of the workflow and the other part of it, um, you know, we've now got more time to free that person up to do other things, right? Now, of course, the challenge is on the organization to figure out what to do with that extra human capital um, that they've now got, or perhaps they decide they don't want that extra human capital. But I think, I think the reality is, I think the most successful organizations are going to be the ones that uh, partition the tasks between humans and machines the best and make use of the extra human capital that they've got in, in the best and most productive way. I would definitely agree. But if you've got a company that's got two employees there or two salesmen, two whatever, and they're underperforming, they've got to cut one of them. Well, we're going to cut one of them. And now the guy that's left is going to have to do two jobs. Nothing really changes. And they assume that the guy can do two. Obviously, it doesn't end up working and it doesn't go productively well you can kind of analogize that to something that could be happening in the future when it comes to automation of well yeah we could take this extra manpower and use this towards growing the business but is that actually what's going to happen and i think that's, that's well, I, one of the questions i i think that's right i mean like in businesses are going to have different strategies right mm -hmm. as, as they take this new effectively take it as a new kind of like type of work or a new kind of intelligence that you've now got inside of your organization and if you think about that, it, it, it's, it's cheap, it's scalable, it's fast, um, it's predictable, it's reliable. It's going to do a whole bunch of things very, very well. And it is doing that. It's starting to do that today. Um, how companies adapt and respond to this um, is, is going to determine the winners and the losers economically of, of, of the corporations. And so I think, I think the jury's out as to what the right strategy is, right? Um, but I would, I would fundamentally bet um, that, you know, you, if you can repurpose the human talent to do things that um, provide an advantage above and beyond what machines can do, um, or even if you can have the humans and the machines working together very positively, then you're going to win, right? Now, I don't exactly know what that looks like for every scenario, but it does feel to me that um, there is something about human intelligence that, that is um, uh, still not um, being able to replicate it accurately by machines. And um, I think I think that combination of different kinds of intelligences is going to lead to better performance. I'm, I'm a big believer in diversity of intelligence, whether it's human diversity or machine diversity, and, and bringing that together to work. So, you know, I don't know if that's a sort of take that on an article of sort of you know ideology or faith, but um, that would be how I would um, how I would run uh, an organization uh, going you know going through this transition. Speculate going forward. 
how long do you think humans will be more something than machines when it comes to all aspects of or many aspects of work productivity etc for instance is is humanity something that machines will never be able to replicate in terms of performance productivity creativity etc or is this something that ultimately we'll see the the end of that paradigm I mean, look, you know, we're getting a sci-fi world. So if you put your science fiction hat on at this, at this sort of juncture and, and allow me a little latitude to, uh, to make predictions that I probably won't be testable in my lifetime, um, I'm happy to take that. Okay, um, that, that's almost the answer right there is you don't think it's in your lifetime. I, I, don't, I don't think so. But, you know, here's, um, here's a couple of things that I think um, we will see, right? We'll see markers being put down to define um, what it is to be human, what it is to be different. And we'll continually see those markers being passed by machines, at which point we will create new markers that maybe delve a little deeper into what it is to be human, at which point the machines will then beat them again. And one of the interesting things on that will be the kind of the time period between us kind of defining something that's different and machines um, surpassing it. So I think in our lifetime, we're going to see a continual re-setting um, of, um, of that, uh, that finish line. Uh, so to speak. And, you know, that's going to be fascinating um, as, as we go through this. So that's one. I think two is that um, in our lifetime, we will um, start to see changes in what we deem to be human as a result of the technology. And what, you know, I think that's going to feel like is when we take that technology away, we will feel less human, right? And we're not there yet, right? I mean, certainly, I think some of the technologies we've created, if you take away language from us, we would feel um, very different. Um, if you take away writing, we would feel very different. We're getting to the place where if you take away, you know, internet connectivity or um, a mobile phone in your pocket, we start to feel a little different. We certainly feel a little um, ang angsty. So I think run that forward 50 years, right? What is the equivalent of taking, you know, the technology that's so fundamental to us um, that we... Um, feel, um, you know, at the very least, um, less human uh, if it's not there. So that will happen in our lifetime. And I think that starts to kind of point to the broader thing, which is actually my thesis on this, is that at some point, it's not, we're not going to be saying the machines and the humans. We're going to be saying, um, you know, w whether we call it the machine or the human, it's going to be some combination of us both. And I think we've seen, you know, very, you know, concretely, if you look at kind of compute, it was something that, you know, we initially was mainframes in another room, then it became, you know, uh, personal computers, which you kind of kept at arm's length, then it became kind of laptops, which came closer, then it became kind of phones in your pocket. Now it's increasingly phones and, you know, computers in your ears, you push that in a little closer, it's, it's computers inside of your ears. Um, there's a sort of trend towards the increased kind of like intimacy of compute from just a, just a, a functional, you know, a physical distance. So run that forward, right, is that trend, and it's been a, you know, a trend kind of 50 years in the making, a, a kind of a closer kind of connectivity with machines physically with us. Um, so I, 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 think, I think we're going to increasingly see this blend of, of humans and machines as potentially being a different and distinct um, entity uh, to, to the people that, that, um, that didn't interact with machines. And we may even look at it as a different species in 100 years' time. Or possibly less, especially with genetic engineering on the rise. Well, that's the other one, right? So that's the other side of this. And, you know, I sort of joke is that, um, you know, you know, we'll probably have the last generation of kind of ugly kids, <laughs> you know, and I say that, you know, with with um, with with respect to our kind of future, um, our future ancestors. But, you know, all the things that we kind of consider to be, um, you know, less than perfect, um, we'll probably start engineering out. Um, and it was interesting. I was chatting with um one of the uh, one of the leading science fiction authors in uh, in China, at um at at a, at a, at a summit in, in Tianjin there, and we were having a conversation, um, a fireside chat at a conference, um, and I asked him, I was like, you know, what do you think about genetically engineering your kids, you know? And he's like, well, why the hell wouldn't you, right? Why would you want your kids to have any any you know any less of? Why would you want them to be disadvantaged, right? And I was like, well, that's that's a different that's a different mindset, and I, you know, than than what we have here in America. So, you know, we may not be the ones controlling this. It may be China that decides they're going to go full on into this. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, I think so, right? And, and you know, you could put, push a, a population IQ like by 10 points up. You could push the height um, by two inches. You could do all sorts of things. Um, and I think as soon as you start looking at that, you're like, yeah, um, even without sophisticated genetic engineering, just with selective, um, selective embryo, embryo uh, um, identification through an IVF, you can probably select for a whole bunch of traits. Um, and at that point, you're like, you know, all right, you know, I, I, we could see that within 20 years for sure. And we already have selective breeding. You don't breed with someone who's 50 or 100 IQ points below you because there's just no interest in conversation. We do the same thing with wealth. We do the same thing with looks. That, that's exactly right. It's, you know, one, one of the big drivers of inequality is people move to cities and um, they become uh, wealthier as, as you're part of cities. Um, there's a correlation with that. And then you you breed with uh, people that are geographically proximate who are also in the cities. And now you've got a compounding effect of wealth uh, and away it goes. Um, we're doing it also with algorithms that start to increasingly um, connect us with people that are more like us, even if they're not explicitly programmed to do that. We start to kind of train them by saying yes and no and swipe left and right. And all of a sudden, it's learning these kinds of things, but implicitly, it's, it's biasing towards, um, you know, homophily. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, that that's a whole other kind of um, piece of the algorithmic acceleration of inequality. Um, but you can see that in many places. And uh, you know, speaking from the kind of the most unequal city in America, um, it's uh, it, it's not. It, it doesn't feel like a good place to be. Yeah, it's. How do we deal with that going forward? Because you do you play in a lot of different areas in terms of your work, but you are living in arguably the most libertarian city in the U.S. when it comes to the economics of how things are going and the future utopia dystopia that we see unwinding in in San Francisco. I'd argue it's anything but the model city at this point, and yet many people. Oh, think... I, I I agree with you. It's high. Uh... I think the thing that surprises me is that like you, I wouldn't have thought like a Gini coefficient city of 0.55 would work, right? It just doesn't feel like it should work. And, you know, I think a lot of people's models kind of say, you know, at some point inequality kind of breaks, um, breaks and, um, you, you know, prove the Teslas. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Elon's got that coming. Um, yeah, but, but it's, it's, um, it's, it, it, it strangely hasn't kind of devolved into kind of un. I was going to be careful. Once. I, I think we're at the edge of workability. So, so maybe 0.6, um, you know, Genie is, is kind of where, where our traditional notions of a workable city breaks. Um, I don't know. Like, that's an interesting question. Like, a, how, how far can you stretch that rubber band before it snaps? And I don't know. I kind of feel like San Francisco is on a, on a march to find out what that is. I, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure um, we're, we're, we're turning it around. Um, and it's interesting when I see a lot of, you know, European friends coming over to San Francisco, they, they are increasingly kind of saying, you know, I came here and my God, how do you live in the city? Right? Like I came out of my hotel and, you know, I was in the middle of a homeless encampment and, you know, you know, and it's like, how, 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 how does a city even work? But and I think those, those of us that live in here and are fortunate to kind of be on, on, on a different side of that, um, economic divide. You know, it just, you know, it, it seems to kind of function. So it's kind of, I, I think we're in this bubble. Um, we're, we're certainly in this bubble um, that I think seems very strange to people who aren't in this bubble. And I think it, you know, it felt strange to me when I first came here. And this was 2009. And, you know, of course, coming from New Zealand, where, you know, at that time, we were one of the most equal countries in the world. Seeing kind of the poverty that was on the streets here kind of was an incredible shock to me. Um, but you know, as, as with everything, you sort of adapt to kind of this new normal. And um, I hope I hope San Francisco doesn't become the new normal, become the model city for the rest of the United States. I hope it doesn't, because I think it's it's a horrible space to kind of, you know, live in with as much inequality. It's not a good it's not a good or sustainable kind of structure. But, you know, I think it kind of might be. It's becoming India. What's the genie? What's the genie coefficient on a city like Mumbai? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I know the Gini coefficient of Guatemala City uh, is like less than San Francisco. Um, so, you know, as, as you look at this, um, it's um, it's kind of, you know, it, we're worse than Guatemala in terms of uh, Guatemala City in terms of in, in inequality. However, you know, and there's a counter to this, right? Like, 
you know, the, 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 the average kind of income is probably higher here and there's certainly skewed upwards by billionaires and, and many millionaires in the city. So like, is, is, is it some combination of genie plus a base layer? And people will argue that, you know, um, it doesn't really matter about the inequality. It matters about the average kind of income and, and so on. Um, there's probably some truth to that. It's definitely better to have a higher, you know, um, higher average income with the same Gini coefficient um, than it is to kind of go the other way. But I think there's still massive issues with, with inequality, even even if your sort of median income in the city as it is here is over $100,000. Uh, um, you know, the, the reality is it's um, inequality te tears at the heart of a community. Yeah, I know you've studied the mathematics of war. Have you ever studied the mathematics of revolution? <sighs> yeah, it's an interesting question. It could be, um, an, inter it could be an interesting follow-up. Yeah, it would, it would be fascinating. But this is why, you know, as I've always been saying here, is like, at what point does this break? And, and, and when can we measure when things break? Um, war and revolution are not so uh, distinct. Um, you know, we like to think of, um, of war as kind of being this different action, of course, um, you know, uh, population unrest and civil conflict and, and political revolution and all of those dynamics. I think you could go to Mozambique and look at Free Limo and, and Renamo there and, you know, look at that as a revolution. You could look at it as a civil war. You could look at it as an all out war. You could look at it as organized crime. I think we have these buckets and categories for conflict that, that we hold in our heads. But the reality is, you know, when the violence unfolds, it all looks very, very similar. One of the things that we have seen um, is um, you know the prediction of when conflict, regardless of if it's revolution or otherwise, um, happens. And you know, there was an interesting paper that came out. It's about four or five years old now. But looking at, at at the dynamics of that, and one of the key dynamics was actually borders. Um, and borders play a huge role in um, in the prediction of, of likely conflict in the future. And um, you know, that's kind of I think you know one of the strong signals we have. Another strong signal is an imbalance of um, uh, an imbalance of um, uh, effectively um, men um, with without that are unmarried. Um, so young unmarried men is, is a strong predictor of conflict. Um, climate um, climate uh, change um, in terms of abrupt climate change, droughts, um, particularly being the, the one um, that moves things. So there's, there are predictors as these things go through um, that are at least directionally kind of accurate. Um, the, the other kind of one that you see is a sense of an us versus them. An us and them almost has to exist before war happens. And you, you can actually track that through language. And, um, you know, if you start looking at narratives that are being told, um, that becomes very, very um, interesting. We're chatting with some folks from uh, the World Bank around this in terms of some projects that they're running inside of um, different, different regions of Africa, looking at, um, you know, that as a predictive signal. Um, so how much, some really is, how much things, of that is yeah. predictive and how much of that is engineered? <laughs> So a lot of we, times we, you'll see similar yep. situations unfolding. For instance, the the revolutions in Syria and more or less the exact same conditions happening in Bahrain, but Bahrain's a U.S. ally, Syria's not. So you see a ton of coverage but of several years ago. I remember having a college ethics professor point this out. You see a ton of coverage of Syrian revolution. Oh, my God, things are so bad. And almost none of Bahrain. And surprise, surprise, we had some of the conflict that we had to rise to rise. And a lot of that wasn't necessarily what was happening. It was just what we were hearing. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, you, you bring up a whole bunch of things there. One is like, where do we as Americans choose to focus our attention, right? And, and that, that's a really interesting question. And, and of all the things that we could look at or understand or focus on, um, which ones do we, do we, do we um, attach attention to and why? The second is, um, are there patterns in the way that things unfold? Um, and, yeah, you know, look, you know, we've been studying the Hong Kong protests and we're seeing patterns and structures in that that are similar to kind of dynamics of, um, of what we've been seeing in like something like the Yellow Vest uh, movement in France. So there are patterns when people get together to kind of create collective actions, protest, conflict, war, that, that do repeat themselves. Um, and then the third is, I think, is, is you... Think about this as sort of self um, self fulfilling prophecy, right? It's like if you know that other things have been successful, you can kind of imitate um, their strategies, and um, and that becomes kind of another way of uh, of, of uh, you know I, I guess maybe consciously this time um, you know organizing um, organizing people into into the same the same uh, structure. Yeah, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. It you rhymes, and yeah, <laughs> that's right. 
You brought up Hong Kong, you brought up China, you brought up trade relations. What are your thoughts on US China future where we're headed? So this is um, a fantastic book, um, you know, called Destined for War. And if you haven't kind of uh, had a look at this, it it kind of, um, I think, is a wonderful, um, a wonderful uh, historical analysis um, of Thucydides' trap. And Thucydides' trap um, is from, uh, this will go back to my classics, but um, Athens and Sparta, um, you know, going uh, head to head and saying, you know, is war between the two um, city-states inevitable? And Thucydides um, was saying, yes. Um, it's inevitable because any uh, major power in the world confronted with a rising power um, will uh, seek to act um, before the other power becomes too big uh, in order to, you know, protect its position at the top of the food chain. And so the book um, by Ellison, you know, Destined for War, went through historically and looked at all the different um, scenarios where there were two powers on a collision course and, and looked and see what happened. And um, the, the net result of the headline of that was 80 percent of the time uh, war happens. So, you know, Thucydides wasn't um, exactly correct. He wasn't saying it's inevitable, but it was very, very likely, right? And so when you look at that from the dynamics of America and China, um, I think you start looking at this and saying, well, you know, if history gives us any lessons, we've got 80% chance of conflict. Um, and that, that is kind of a, is probably a reasonable starting point for a set of priors to work through that. Now, 80% of anything is you should probably think about it and plan for it. Um, at the very least, you shouldn't be surprised when it happens. So what does that kind of mean? Um, I think the first thing that we'll see on that is um, America has got a Pacific fleet, a Pacific military, and it's got control, broadly speaking, of the Pacific. Um, China doesn't want that, right? So at some point, China says, um, you know, the China seas are ours, right? You don't put your warships through here. And, you know, where that is concrete is the U.S. reserves the right to kind of put um, a battle uh, group through the Straits of uh, Taiwan. And China's like, you know, if you do that, there will be trouble. Um, we haven't tested that since Clinton, um, but we still reserve the right to do it. Um, if we did that, would that cause issues? Probably, uh, probably, right? So there's, there's probably gonna be this piece and it's sort of that line when they said, when, you know, um, when China stands on its coast, you know, China sees, China sees. Um, and there's the sense that that's their territory, that's their space. And America is like, no, 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 we, we are still um, a, dominant, um, a dominant force in, in the Pacific. And um, this kind of brings us back to, you know, um, Britain and its Navy. And Britain was kind of like, you know, we have the dominant naval force. And then at some point they said, actually, um, you know, we're going to give up and, and secede um, kind of control of the waters around the Americas. Um, I think it happened first in Venezuela, um, where they said, you know, America, that's yours. And we're not going to we're not going to say this is our kind of dominion. So, you know, that was a very friendly thing it was two two kind of culturally aligned countries kind of, you know, sort of agreeing not to kind of compete in the American, um, you know, maritime space. Um, I don't think we're going to have such similar kind of cultural or ideological uh, um, relationships with China. And so um, it's probably not going to be a, a painless handover. Were they cultural? Were they economic? Let's play devil's advocate, but in a positive way. In Thucydides' time, Greek, whatever in God's name is, name is I can't yeah. really pronounce it well. How interconnected were the economies? Because oh, now you, yeah, the, less, the less interconnected the economy are, the more I'm willing to shove a pike up my neighbor's you-know-what because yeah. it doesn't affect me. But when it affects me, that's another story, as both sides are seeing as we have our silly trade war. Right. right. So two or three things that come through. One thing that actually ratchets up these conflicts is kind of um, – uh, sort of um, almost contractual agreements or alliances. And it's kind of like, if you do that, we must do this. If you do this, we must do that. If you do this, we must do this. So things can escalate, right? And there's a few of those escalations that could happen, right? Um, any attack on Taiwan would be seen kind of like, well, you know, the US traditionally had had an escalation on that. Any attack certainly on Japan would, would result in a kind of a treaty, um, you know, requirement and obligation from the US. So this is kind of, you know, where some of these pieces come. NATO, of course, you know, attack on one is an attack on all. Um, you, you're kind of forced to kind of play your hand. So treaties between countries are one of the pieces that can ratchet things up. On the other side, you know, trade relationships are things that can kind of ratchet them down. So one of the interesting things we're looking at here is how tight are the U.S.-China trade relationships? You know, the answer has been they've been very tight. Um, this is sort of the uh, the sort of the McDonald's kind of paradox, right? Like, you know, any, any country that has McDonald's won't go to war with each other because they're so sophisticated such that the integration of their economic and trade obligations would mean that any kind of conflict between, you know, the two would hurt both as much. 
I think the course that the counter to that is, well, are we seeing an increased connectivity of um, these things or are we seeing a partitioning? And I've been watching that, right? And we're seeing kind of, a, you know, the first things we've seen here has been, um, we're seeing with Huawei. You know, um, Huawei's like, we will give you very cheap kind of routers. And um, America's like, we don't want your routers, you know, connecting everything that we have on our information networks. So you don't get to play here. Um, you know, since time, iFly Tech, two of the big Chinese AI companies in imagery and language, you know, US is like, you know, we don't want you doing business here. Um, and China, you know, absolutely, we don't want, you know, American companies or China doesn't want American companies doing business. So I think we're going to see a partitioning um, of these technological spaces. And it, it's easiest to happen at the application and the AI and the machine learning layer. It's harder at the hardware and it's much, much harder down at the chip level. And one of the interesting dynamics you look between China and uh, the U.S. is the um, is the uh, uh, supply chain of U.S. computer chips uh, making their way to China. And China um, only produces 17 percent um, of the computer chips that it uses um, and almost none of the advanced um, GPUs that it uses. So if China were to go to war um, with the U.S. at the moment, it would basically be forced to cut off its um, semiconductor supply. So that would be a bad idea, right? Now they realize this and there's a lot of investment going into that, right? And you can kind of see some of the, 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 the trade restrictions that are coming in place kind of forcing China's hand. It also brings kind of into, into to kind of like stark focus Taiwan, right? Taiwan has a huge semiconductor industry, um, you know, and it kind of, it's not quite an analogy to, uh, to kind of oil and gas, but you can certainly see it, right? Like. If you don't have energy independence, um, it's very hard to kind of fight a war. If you don't have technology independence, it's going to be very hard to fight a war. And so that's kind of part of the reason I would say that Taiwan becomes a really, really key, um, you know, uh, chess piece uh, amongst all of this. Because because ultimately, um, I think the thing that's stopping America and China, you know, ratcheting up too far is that China simply doesn't want to kind of confront any kind of conflict where it would be constrained by um, semiconductors, which you know, or effectively the energy of, of technology. How much of the current dynamics we're seeing right now are being played out because of fear? So both sides are worried about giving advantages to the other side, thereby making war more likely because they are separating themselves further. It's almost like the thing you fear the most, the thing you repulse the most is really what you pull towards you. That, that's sort of this, this thing, right? Like it's, um, this part of Thucydides uh, trap is that no one ever really wants this. And yet, you know, we start, you know, seeing kind of the dynamic of like, well, if we don't do this, then they'll do that. And if, if they do that, we'll do this. Um, and if you've read um, the three body problem, if you look at the second book, the dark forest, I mean, that's sort of without spoiler alerts for those that um, haven't read it, but that's sort of the heart of this, which is like, we're in this dark universe. We don't know what they're going to do. They might do something. We better act now before they do something. And, you know, it's got this kind of like story in it as well, which is, you know, I think yeah, you could replace, you know, um, you know, the Tricellarians with, um, you know, um, I, I don't know if the Tricellarians are the Americans. I think they might be. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the Earth is the Chinese. Um, but, you know, you've got this kind of thing that's like, you know, over 400 years, um, you know, the technology curve can advance so much that by the time the kind of the conflict happens, one side's got a tremendous advantage over the other one. Right. And this is kind of the nature of technology, which is, um, you know, it can kind of move on these different kind of curves and uh, these different kind of linear or exponential kind of progressions will will render one side an advantage in the future. Now, if you're looking at that and saying we're kind of linearly increasing our capabilities, but they're exponentially increasing, even if they're not a threat today, at some point I see these two curves passing and we better act now. Right. And this is kind of the dark forest dynamic um, is we don't have full kind of like visibility. But we do know that, um, you know, progression doesn't happen linearly. And so even if things aren't a threat today, we better act against them. And, you know, I, I, I think there's some truth to that, right, if you take it from a purely game theoretic perspective. Um, of course, this brings us back into kind of game theory, which had fallen out of fashion, um, you know, because we haven't had great states kind of conflict for our lifetime. Um, not really. So um, this, this is interesting times. Is there any way that we can get leaders to avoid that? I mean, short of getting them together and having them hit LSD or something and have a kumbaya experience. Is there a way that we can try to prevent these type of things from happening? 
I think I think you know one of the things that comes through on this is intelligence. Um, you know, in the kind of the military sense of it is crucial. Um, if you're operating in the dark, um, you know, the the dark side of the dark forest is uh, is the problem. So if you can shine a light on this, um, you're not having a second guess. And, and I think, you know, one of the things here is I think where machines and and uh, artificial intelligence can do a wonderful job is starting to kind of understand all the different components, how they're interacting, and uh, and keeping track of, of, of that in a way that I think gives us humans a little more kind of security. Um, I think by the time you're kind of reacting to an incoming um, hypersonic missile um, and deciding whether or not you should use AI to kind of retaliate, I think it's obviously too late. Um, so, you know, an understanding um, of um, of your opponents is, is probably the crucial uh, piece of this. I think the second bit is tying tying both parties to a shared outcome, right? And that's that's the sort of the game theory piece is like, you know, any action um, that hurts me hurts you. And and if we do nothing, um, then we both win. So that, that kind of, obviously, that kind of payoff matrix is where you want to be. So how do we engineer that? And how do we use AI to kind of help us, um, help us kind of monitor our, our, um, our tracking towards that? Um, so I think, I think, I don't have those answers, but um, I can I can certainly I can certainly think that um, being in the dark um, and not being able to kind of understand where everything is um, is, is going to be problematic. Um, and I do think we can use AI to kind of shine a light on uh, on some of these pieces. What about autonomous weapons? Um, I, I think so. Let's let's yeah, just throw that one out there. <laughs> Might as well go for nice the camera <laughs> It's like, you know, people are like, you know, what, what about the killer robots? And um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think so. As is, is I look at this here, there's going to be a degree of autonomy that's um, that's going to be inevitable. The question is how much autonomy? And, you know, it's kind of like we go back to World War II and the hit rate of anti-aircraft guns um, manually controlled um, was improved about 10x um, by um, putting in um, a, a degree of automation, um, inverted commas, we wouldn't call it automation today, but it was certainly automation. Um, and they got 10 times greater hit rates. Um, so we've had autonomous weapons um, for a long time. Um, you know, you can have computer, um, you know, course correcting snipers bullets um, for, for wind and, and, and uh and um, atmospheric conditions, right? It's not fully autonomous. Someone's still pulling a trigger, but it's being kind of targeted by a machine. Um, you know, you've got precision guided munitions once, you know, the or even a cruise missile is an autonomous weapon. Once it goes, it goes. Um, so, right, so we, we've got autonomous weapons. We don't have autonomous weapons with what we call kind of latest generation AI, right? Which is a step up, right? It's, 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 the, it's the drone with the facial detection, seeking out a target, you know, with a, with a, uh, you know, a, an incendiary device kind of, you know, strapped to it. Um, and that does feel kind of different. Um, it, it, a swarm of kind of um, drones attacking a, 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 a you know, a, a, a battle group um, from the ocean. Um, it feels different. Um, now, at some point, someone's still giving it targets, right? Um, and I think the question is, is where do you want that to be? Is it okay? For someone to be like, if you find, um, you know, Baghdadi, please kill him, right? Is that all right? Or is it got to be like, hey, human, I found Baghdadi. Do you still want to kill him, right? Um, so that, that's an interesting kind of question. At that point, you know, is, is it okay for that command to be a year in advance? Is it all right for it to be only five seconds in advance? But at that point, we're debating the time of autonomy, not is there autonomy, right? So it's an interesting kind of, you know, philosophical question is that what, you know, how, maybe it's if reframing is how long are we okay with um, autonomy um, operating for? Um, and, you know, in a hypersonic cruise missile, it might be minutes and in, in a drone kind of targeting an individual, it might be a year. Um, a year feels not good. A, a minute or two seems okay. So is, is that the argument? And that's not the argument that people have, but you could certainly re frame it that way you could but that would be a moralistic way to handle it because once we have that technology it's no different than saying head over to that village in, in afghanistan and shoot everyone or find or seek and destroy it doesn't have to well, be well, selective no it doesn't have to be selective no it absolutely doesn't and if you go back to dresden and you can you know as you read uh
Uh, you can also go into Allied bombing the first time it sees precision, the US bombing really um, inside of um, Iraq in the first Gulf War. Very, very different kind of thing. Like, in, you know, you, you don't want to be in either scenario, but, you know, on balance, you would take precision guided munitions attacking a town versus the fire bombing of Dresden. Um, going kind of one further forward is like, well, if you can selectively hit a target rather than um, a compound, you know, maybe you could, you know, take bin Laden out without killing the rest of his family, right? Or without kind of risking the kind of like, cost, you know. What about cost curves? Because when that happens and the U.S. government can do it, so can I, because suddenly well, the that, costs that, have come down so much. Right. So now, now you're going into kind of the dynamic of like insurgency but, being empowered by these things. And that, that may be, you know, we've, we've seen you know, horrific attacks with people driving, you know, cars and trucks into kind of crowds. Well, you know, how far are we from running an autonomous vehicle through a crowd? And, and you know, that's probably within the, I mean, you could probably imagine a $5 million hack on a Tesla to kind of drive it autonomously through, you know, crowds of people at the Beta Breakers in San Francisco here. I hope that's not happening anytime soon, but you could certainly think of that as being te technologically feasible. Now, why is that important? You don't need effectively someone who's effectively a suicide um, zealot at that point. They can just um, abstract themselves uh, from this. And so, you know, the cost of doing this primarily is reduced by you don't need a you don't need somebody um, who's willing to give up their life for the kind of the cause. Rather, just the, they're willing to kind of um, act with a much, much lower chance of, of having any consequences. Um, so we're going to see that. Um, you know, absolutely going to see that because it is possible. Um, the other thing on kind of killer weapons and, you know, to be clear, the U.S.'s um, stance on this is uh, we will only use autonomous weapons for defense. We will not use autonomous weapons for attack. Um, and that's great until your opponent comes through and says we'll use autonomous weapons uh, for attack. And um, and you're confronted with a decision is like, well, I'm losing. Um, do I wish to kind of hold on to this moralistic belief? And that's where the thing really gets tested. I think the other bit here, which will come through, and it, it comes in time of thought, right? So one of the things about um, humans is we're slow. We see that in financial markets. We're not outcompeted because we're dumb than the machines. We're not stupider than machines. We're outcompeted because we're slower. So you take the scenario and we've got it, and it is quite important. Um, hypersonic missiles um, coming in reduce the time from launch to, to target. Um, down to kind of mere minutes, maybe three and a half minutes, depending on the launch position. Um, if you want to run, now you put a nuclear weapon on that and, and go forward. So now you've you've got three and a half minutes to react to an incoming nuclear hypersonic missile, right? If you say we will not launch an attack against another country with AI, right? And that's currently the, the DOD's um, positions, the White House and the current administration's position. We will not use AI to kill. Um, then you are saying we will react in three and a half minutes by a human chain of command um, to an incoming hypersonic nuclear missile, at which point you're saying we will take the first hit and we will then be a second hit nation. So fundamentally, the U.S. will um, take and absorb the first nuclear attack and will react um, with a human chain of command to a nuclear attack um, on uh, an opponent. So that's that that's that's the kind of the nature of, of where we're going to be sitting. The the other side of that is no 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 we will detect the incoming hypersonic missile and we will launch our own hypersonic missiles against the opponent and we will do that all through autonomous um, AI, and that also doesn't feel very good, right? You're like well shit you want AI to kind of run your nuclear um, arsenal against an opponent, so we're we're in a bit of a conundrum here, right? Um, do do you want to take the first hit and kind of concede that to opponents, or are you okay? with an autonomous launch of nuclear weapons. And you gotta sit here and say, both of those seem like pretty, pretty bad outcomes, but we are confronted with this. Do we need a second punch theory? Uh, not theory, um, treaty. So for instance, a mutually assured, you, sh you shoot first and all of the rest of us are gonna shoot you back second type deal to prevent something like this, which seems, seems to be ratcheting things up in a really negative and problematic way but it seems like that could be a solution at least on a state actor level although the problems we have probably won't be state actors right so the point is you can run these human systems um but at some point the speed of decisions um become computer systems and um i think that's probably the big bit that we sort of as humans versus machines um we we are just fundamentally um constrained by a 650 millisecond strategic response time 
Um, what are we at 30 bits per second in terms of information communication through language? Um, you know, we've got latency um, all through our kind of human systems. And speed of action, speed of thought is, is where machines just absolutely um, uh, dominate um, the human brain. And, um, you know, I think I think traditionally we'd had human kind of lines. It was like, hey, you know, you could ring up and be like, is this a missile? Did you guys launch a missile? Is this a right? And you could do that. But as that time compresses, you don't have time for that. And so I think one of the interesting things for us is, um, you know, in, in a world particularly of hypersonics, how do we get human decision making running um, quickly enough in order to respond? And there's sort of an open question. It's like, even if you could make a human decision on that in three minutes, should you? Right. Is that even something that humans in three minutes can possibly fathom or should? Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm not thrilled about that kind of conundrum. But I think it's one that as a kind of a, a sort of a, a mind experiment is one we should all kind of reflect on a little bit and say, well, what, what, what is the right outcome here? I want to I want to pivot this a little bit. Yeah. What's the future of education look like? Yeah. Um, so that, that's a happier place, isn't it? That's sort of an easier <laughs> place. I think it actually looks very good. Um, you know, um, we, um, and so, you know, my dad, my dad was a teacher. My mom was a teacher. My brother and my sister are teachers. I've, uh, I think my, uh, my dad always used to kind of say to me is like, you know, it's like, when are you going to be a teacher? It was always the, uh, the piece of um, things. And so very, very near and dear to my heart, um, education and, and, and teaching and, and learning. Um, uh, I think, I think there's a huge opportunity at the moment for us to learn a lot from machines um, as they look at the world and teach us about the world and things and, and ways that we couldn't see or we couldn't understand. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for them to personalize that um, in ways that are, that are there for us. I also think there's a wonderful opportunity for us as humans to use um, the machines as kind of tools to create and do new things. And, you know, it, it's been fascinating. I think someone said, you know, these, these language generation models um, are to kind of writing what the calculator, you know, was to maths. And it, it's a wonderful kind of thought to kind of think about what kind of things can you create when you've got a machine that can, you know, do unto writing what calculators did unto, un, unto mathematics. And so there's some beautiful pieces there. There's also kind of some of the pieces here of like, can I construct, a, you know, a, um, a lesson for you? Um, you know, you know, taking all the right information and, and bringing it to you in a way that resonates in the way that, let, that that allows you to learn the most. And this goes back, you know, our, our company is, is called Primer. Um, it's based off of, um, you know, the inspiration from the book, Neil Stevenson's book, The Diamond Age, where there was a, a book called The Primer. And The Primer um, was a book that was, uh, was designed um, to, to teach and educate children and um, to kind of personalize that information to write in a way that would be most effective for them um, to understand and learn about the world that was around them. And of course, you know, without spoiling the book, it, it goes through and of course there's unintended consequences that come from that and the rest of it. But, you know, I think that the central premise here of like, if you can design AI that can understand the world and can understand us, you can do wonderful things for that. And at the moment we've scratched that surface and kind of been, I think, you know, shocked at how easily we can kind of manipulate um, populations with this kind of technology. I say we in the in the general sense. It's not we as in the, as, as as primer. But um, but of course, um, education is effectively a, a kind of a degree of uh, of changing how people see the world, which is a close cousin to manipulation. So you know, if we turned our attention and said, well, if we took this technology and, and and used it for education, what would we be able to do with it? And it turns out that I you know I think that this technology is uniquely position for education it just really hasn't had the the hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue that um kind of arise from other kinds of manipulation how do we solve something like that where we have so many big problems that need solving and so much money going towards selling us the next who'd you watch it um i i think you know this goes back to kind of some of the earlier pieces here and it's um you discussed about inequality and you know one of the one of the ways to solve inequality is is for sure taxation. It's a tried and true method, and you can think of different methods of taxation. But one of those is that, and you invest back into the common good. Um, you know, and if you believe in the common good, um, you know, you've got to find a way to fund it. Um, and one way to fund it is is uh, through taxation. Um, 
and I, and I, I would fundamentally believe that um, you know education is, is, a, is a common good. Um, and it's something that we should um, collectively fund and finance. Um, that's not to say that we should do it how we've always been doing it, and it's not to say that the current way we're funding and financing education is the correct way of doing that. But I do think it's something we as a society should invest in. And then you start saying, well, would we be okay with, of all the tech companies that use AI, and to say if you use AI to do um, anything, you must, um, you know, you must put some of that AI money, profits, revenue, or even kind of potentially equity of the company back into the education space. And I think, you know, um, that that's an interesting kind of um, thing is we are undoubtedly creating huge amounts of wealth. Um, is there a requirement to give that back um, to society for education? And if we did, um, you know, what could we then do with this? So th there's one part of this is, is, is who's going to fund it. The second is what can we do with the technology? And the third is whose responsibility is this? Right. And, you know, I, I think we should all start with the kind of the first premise of like, you know, do we want to fund and finance education? And, and if we can agree on that, then we can kind of figure out the second and third pieces of this, this puzzle. Do you think the U.S. is fundamentally capable of navigating that change? We have a much more individualistic culture, I would argue, than Europe or New Zealand. And as someone who's now in San Francisco, what are your thoughts? It does seem to be... Um... It does seem to be in a place where it's struggling to do anything at a, at a kind of a, a scale that involves everyone, um, and or collective or collective good, or co collective good. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's 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 kind of take collective good as a sense. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why as kind of a, an outsider coming, you know, in that 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 exists. Um, it, it strikes me as strange that we could be in a city that's collectively or in an area of the world that's collectively created a trillion plus dollars of market capitalization in the last decade. And yet, you know, still have so many kind of problems with with um, access to kind of, um, you know, education, access to kind of health, access to, you know, resources to kind of enjoy that benefit. It, it just it strikes me as kind of um, obscene. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it, I, you got to think America's capable of this. I, I it, it seems it seems as though it should be capable, but yet time and again, perhaps it proves that it isn't. Um, so I, I don't know. But look, come, come back on this. There's a huge upswelling of, you know, I, what would have been kind of considered radical left wing kind of economic theory and policy if you flick on any of the, the kind of the left side of the Democratic Party, it is swinging, you know, hard towards that. And one of the tenets of the space is, is um, you know, redistribution of wealth and, you know, investment into the common good. So, you know, this is a very dominant kind of ideology, much more so than kind of the libertarian enclave of sort of the Silicon Valley. I think it is much more mainstream. Um, it's still not kind of dominant, you know, in, in the Democratic Party, but you know, swing swing a few votes a different way, and you can take Warren as the presidential candidate, and it's it's going to be kind of down the fairway for her on some of these pieces, right? So, you know, is is that going to be the response? Um, is that going to be um, you know where we start to see America kind of embrace um, some collective action, um, collective uh, good? Um, sorry, not collective action, collective good, um, maybe. Yeah, we have a we have a third world healthcare system at this point. It's oh, that third world healthcare at first world prices, um, ridiculous. I mean, for for all of these kind of pieces, you know, I, you, you know, it's like, yeah, we're the worst performing health system on a cost dollar basis. Um, certainly in the OECD time, times times two. So times two and, and yeah, it's and, not, and, yeah. And, and and life expectancy that that's 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 and this is the thing that gets me right. Life expectancy that's going in, in the wrong direction um, and doubly in the wrong direction if you're in the bottom kind of 10 percent. And, you know, if you look at the life expectancy of the top 10 percent of the population, the bottom 10 percent, fundamentally, if you're born poor, you are going to live on order of 10 years, potentially as things go, 15 years less than if you're born rich. And I think it's like what are the things that break inequality? I think if people woke up and said, you know, I don't really mind about taxes, I don't really mind about, you know, money, but geez. I get 15 years less life for being born poor. This doesn't make sense. Like, this is not fair. Like, and I'm not sure people have really woken up around that, but if you're born poor, you are sentenced to a, an early death. 
and 10 IQ uh, which points. Which is 10 IQ points yeah, 10, as well. 10 IQ points and all the rest of it. Like, you, you will not be as smart, you know, on, on IQ, you know, measurements, you know. But but I think fundamentally it, it's kind of like like you, you are going to have 15 years potentially wiped off of your life for being born poor. And we're still kind of in this – sort of story and I think it's the sort of the issue that America has is this very, very strong narrative like, well, I could just work my way out of this. And yes, some people do, but that's becoming increasingly hard as well. So I you know, I'm not sure when that kind of like, you know, it snaps or it breaks. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're starting to kind of find out, right? And this has been part of the upswelling of the of the left the left side of the Democratic Party is is certainly kind of a bit of a rear guard action against this. So there's two different things that you can incentivize or focus on. You can focus on having a high average or having a high absolute. So if you look yep. at the big differences between the U.S. and Europe, the Europe has very high in terms of averages. You have high education. You have good health care. You have solid but not incredible salaries. You have decent yep. but not impossibly large companies. But when you when you put your you can think about it in terms of no child left behind. If you put your resources yeah. into bringing kids up from the bottom to raise the average, you're not putting those resources into the AP, the smartest kids, so to speak. If you put yeah. the resources instead into the smartest kids, bringing them higher up, then you create more of a, a higher ceiling, but lower of an average. And I think we can see the differences that have evolved for one reason or another. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right. I mean, one of the things I've sort of come back to and, and sort of say, I think, you know, what what level of inequality are we OK with? And what is the absolute kind of growth of the average that we want to shoot for? And as you sort of start designing around those parameters and it's not to say everything should be equal, but there's this also is this like, you know, it's not to say that everything should be so unequal that it doesn't kind of feel fair. And we one of the things if you're kind of designing these systems is like what kind of degree of mobility is the right kind of degree of mobility? What degree of inequality is the right degree of that? How many people that are born into the top 10% are we comfortable letting fall into the bottom 10% over the course of their lifetime, right? Like, is it a, they don't, it doesn't feel like great questions to kind of ask, but of course, you know, if you want someone from the bottom 10% to come to the top 10%, um, definitionally, some people have to move out of that. So um, now we can do all of that against um, with mobility and and, um, and, and transition between different strata of society whilst moving the average upwards, right? Um, you know, so there's, you know, to, to add to your kind of, you know, piece is, is what degree of mobility is, is, is part of these societies too. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what all the answers, is. Like this is, this is where you get into kind of some of the, you know, economic theorists are going to be probably more, um, you know, more uh, aligned with some of these answers. But um, or at least the theories, and we can debate on the answers. But there's probably data for this, and there are probably studies out there. I think it's more on us as a society to start thinking about this and thinking about it concretely as to what we want to design towards. And you know, I wish we would have more of this discussion at the political level in the U.S. Um, but absent of that, we can drive that discussion at the political level by having it at the local level, having it amongst you know our friends, having it amongst our communities, and it becomes an issue for us. It will become an issue for the political space. So this is on us to kind of say, you know, what do we do with the wonderful kind of things that technology has given us in terms of generation of wealth, and how do we take this and do things with it? And it's gonna be the same, not just with, with, with wealth, but with, if we are automating people out of roles, you know, what do we do with all that wonderful human capital that we've got and you know some of the wonderful things that came out of the automation of um you know farm labor was was a huge amount of, of workers freed up um of course there was a depression and a couple of world wars amongst that but you know one of the things that was done was the creation of uh of um of the uh the, the u.s interstate um uh, was was it was it was a uh, was a kind of like we've got extra workers let's go and let's go and put them to work what's the equivalent of a, that huge piece of infrastructure that the u.s could create um with all of this talent um you know, so I, I, I would kind of I, I think we're going to be in a place where we're going to have excess human capital and certainly excess kind of money being kind of accumulated um, as a society. And I, I think there's, there's a great question is how do we how do we um, take that um, to build the kind of world that we want? Um, and, and what is that world that we want? 
And that's the purpose of this podcast, guys, to ask those questions and to get other people to do the same. If you haven't, subscribe, disruptors.fm slash iTunes. Share it around with folks if you think this is important conversations. I got to jump to the lightning round now. How does that sound, Sean? This sounds great. Bring it on. And if you guys haven't supported us yet, support us, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. You unlock bonus questions here, bonus episodes, some awesome free stuff, and the biggest high five in the world from us by helping us make this more sustainable. Let's do it. There we go. We're going to war with ourselves, guys. That will be a fun one. Let's hope it doesn't happen, but there's plenty of places where we've got sparks happening. Let's jump back to the episode. Last question before we wrap things up. I know I want to be respectful of your time. If you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, I'll call it action. It can be anything. Before you tell them more where to find you and all that good stuff, what would it be and why? Yeah, great question. Um, I think I think for me the um, the thing I would I would encourage um, everyone to do is the world is changing so quickly. Um, I think we need to find a way to get ahead of that so that we got time to wrestle with some of the changes that seem to be coming at us so quickly. So I would say go and embrace science fiction. Pick up a book, any book. Start living in a world that looks different or feels different to the world that we're in. Start wrestling with those challenges um, and then bring that back to the world that we're in today with some lessons from that. I think we could all um, use more science fiction in our lives. Um, and I think that's, at least for me, it's been a, uh, it's been a very, very useful tool to kind of, um, to kind of orientate myself around a, a world that seems to be changing quicker than we can, uh, that we can handle. So uh, pick up a science fiction book. Amen. Let's get rid of some of the garbage books they teach in school and pop in some science fiction ones instead. Absolutely. Just so we can learn something. What's your favorite sci-fi book or movie? Um, my, mine, uh, you can kind of see it to the back here, um, Blade Runner, um, for sure. Um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep and Philip K. Dick's uh, work is, is 100% um, that. And I think, uh, I think um, it, you know, maybe it's a little contrary and, um, on that as well. I think the new movie was better than the old one, but that's, uh, that'll be a little more controversial. <laughs> that will be a little more controversial. Where can people find you and be beat you up about that opinion? You can come to me on Twitter at S. Gawley, um, and uh, I, will, uh, I, will, I will defend my Blade Runner um, uh, ranking system uh, there, but that's the best place to find me. So, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter. Links and everything in the show notes, guys. Disruptors.fm. Follow me on Twitter at what, as well, Matt Ward IO. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you love it, share it around with a friend. Give Sean a huge high five on Twitter. And until next time, go pick up a sci-fi book. Maybe mine. That's coming out soon. Cheers. <laughs>